Hello and welcome to our online service for this, the celebration of Reformation Day from Pinnacle Lutheran Church in Rochester, New York. A reminder, you can find all of our services as well as an online daily devotion at our website, pinnaclelutheran.org. Our opening hymn today is Preserve Your Word, O Savior. Please pause the service video and click the hymn link below. And we make our beginning in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. O Almighty God, merciful Father. I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our service continues with our psalm. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Amen. And the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Merciful Lord, in darkness you shine your light and send forth your word that those who hear may believe and believing may live by your gracious favor. As once you renewed a people lost in error and without the comfort of your gospel, so bring this renewal to our own time, that sin may be forgiven, death overcome, and faith may cling to Christ alone. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now today we commemorate the Great Reformation and we lay claim to this legacy of pure doctrine and the zeal for the proclamation of this gospel that grew out of this movement. We give thanks to God for his gospel, for the doctrine that flows from that gospel, and for Martin Luther, who recalled the church to its truth with such clarity and with such conviction. In the first reading from Revelation, we hear the message the church is given to proclaim until Christ comes again. In our reading from Romans, Paul gives clear explanation of what it means to be saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And in the gospel, 
uh, of John, we are taught that we are his disciples and free because we abide in his life-giving word. Our service continues with our readings. Our first reading is from Revelation chapter 14, beginning with verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. We speak the gradual from Psalm 48. Great, great is the Lord, Lord and, and greatly to be praised, praised in the, in the city, city of our God. God. Walk, Walk about Zion, Zion go, go around, around her, number, number her towers, towers consider, consider well her ramparts, go through, through her citadels, citadels that, that you may tell the next generation that this is God, God our God, God forever, forever and ever. Our epistle is from Romans chapter 3, beginning with verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. We speak the Alleluia and verse from Luke. Alleluia, fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Alleluia. And the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And our hymn of the day today is A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Please pause the service video and click the hymn link below. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's hard to believe we're actually coming close to the end of the church year. Today we celebrate Reformation Day. Of course, Reformation Day itself won't be for a few more days. In fact, on October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther nailed 95 theses or 95 statements for debate to the church door in Wittenberg, Germany. And that traditionally has become the starting point of what we've known as the Reformation. And the Reformation especially is about the rediscovery of the gospel in the church. The gospel that Paul so clearly explains in our epistle lesson from Romans today. And Luther didn't intend to start a reformation. Luther didn't intend to divide the church. Luther only wanted to have a discussion with the church at the time as to what they thought about the forgiveness of sins and what place Jesus played in that versus 
was there any part for us to play in that? Of course, the Word of God says no. The Word of God says we rely solely on Christ and what He has done for us. But that is not the institution that He was up against. And so Luther couldn't stand idly by when he knew that the forgiveness that Christ had won on the cross was not being proclaimed. And he knew that people had no sure comfort that their sins were being forgiven. They weren't hearing the clear message of the gospel. And, be, and that's because what Luther rediscovered, what Paul tells us, what God tells us through Paul in our epistle today, and really throughout the entire New Testament, is that forgiveness, that salvation are freely given to us by His grace alone as a gift that we receive through faith. Nothing that we do, nothing that we are in and of ourselves is counted for anything. Our salvation is given us by grace alone, through faith alone, based on what Christ has done for us alone. And it occurred to me, as I looked through all of my sermons, actually in all the years that I've been preaching on Reformation, that I had never really gone through um, some, of the, some of the actual events of the year 1517 and some of the things in Luther's life that led up to that. And so as we get into the sermon, we'll start to talk about that. And we think that the message that Luther rediscovered, that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, based on the work of Christ alone, is something that's just so fundamental, so routine, that we hear it over and over again. We don't think we need to hear it again. And yet, if that were the case, why is it that we have to keep being reminded about it so often? Even we, who've grown up in a church, hearing this over and over again, still need to be reminded of it because it's still not the way that our minds work. We don't live in a free world. We live in a world that's quid pro quo. We, if, you want to earn, if you want to have something in the world, you earn it. If you want a good job, you have to work hard. If you want a good education, you have to, you have to go out and work on it. If you want to be first on the team, you have to work on it. Nobody gives you those positions. And so even though we understand at least we think we understand that we're saved by grace through faith alone, we often still import that worldly understanding into the church. And it's worth being reminded again that we are saved by grace through faith, that we are not made righteous in the, in the eyes of God by what we have done, by who we are, by how, many, um, by how many our fathers we've said or how many services we've attended or how many times we've kept the golden rule. We Oh, we don't earn our salvation. The gospel, the good news of the forgiveness of sins and eternal life isn't earned by a good life or by pious prayers or hard work. It's yours by grace, by grace alone, a gift made possible only by the work of God's beloved Son, Jesus Christ. And it's absolutely remarkable to me, even 500 years later, looking back on the events of 1517, that the church could have forgotten that, that somehow the church could have confused the message of the gospel and replaced it with a series of works that, and, and systems by which people had to earn their forgiveness or at least go through a process where they might be assured that they might have forgiveness. So let's take a moment, as I mentioned a minute ago, to talk about some of the events in Luther's life that led up to this moment, what it was that compelled him to be able to risk his life for the sake of the gospel. So many of you may know the story, but I'll, I'll review it just for, just for context. Initially, Luther was studying at the university to become an attorney. Um, his father had done reasonably well as a minor, and so he had had enough money to send Luther to the university. He was hoping his son would be an attorney so that he would, of course, make more money. And he had dreams for his son. And we find that Luther was very intelligent. He did very well. At university, he was doing very well in his law studies, and yet one day he was trapped in a lightning storm on his way home from university, and lightning was falling all around him. He was so afraid that he was going to lose his life, he cried out to St. Anne saying, you know, if you will spare my life, I promise that I will, I will leave university and enter a monastery and become a monk. And the rest is history because, of course, Luther didn't die in that storm, and when he got home, he actually did resign from university, much to his father's chagrin, and enrolled in a monastery and became a monk. And yet, while he was there, he excelled there as well. 
He excelled in his studies. He was brilliant at theology. And he eventually earned a doctorate in theology and started to teach um, in Wittenberg, was teaching theology in, in Wittenberg. But there was something that plagued Luther at the time. There was something that continued to come up over and over and over again. Luther didn't feel worthy of God's grace. Luther knew that he wasn't worthy of God's grace, and he couldn't understand, he, couldn't, he could never feel comfortable with many of the phrases that he heard in Scripture that compared our unrighteousness, our unworthiness, our sinfulness with the all-holiness of God. As Luther himself said, in spite of all the ardor of my heart, all the things that I was trying, I was hindered by the unique word in the first chapter of Romans. The righteousness of God is revealed in it. That is, in the gospel. And he says, I hated the word righteousness of God because in accordance with the usage and custom of the doctors, those who had been in the Roman Catholic Church and the common usage of the righteousness of God, it was a righteousness according to which God is righteous and punishes sinners and the unjust. And Luther realized there was nothing he could do. He was tormented day and night by the idea that he could never be clean. He could never earn God's grace. He could never um, be in right standing with God. And yet, as he continued to teach and to preach, as he continued to teach theology and, and teach scripture, um, at that time there was a movement afoot where even in the Roman Catholic Church, the people were getting back to the text of Scripture, the Greek text of Scripture, the Hebrew text of Scripture. And as Luther read and studied and preached, he realized that forgiveness was not something we earn by our worthiness, but rather forgiveness is a gift of God. It is given by grace. And so then, as we come to the year 1517, he'd been at Wittenberg for a number of years at that point, he became angered by the selling of indulgences. And indulgences were pieces of paper that promised the bearer that they could be forgiven their sins for having, for having paid the money. And, and there was no assurance, however, in, the, in these indulgences. Luther was, was, um, was amazed that the church could be buying and, buying and selling these pieces of paper that had nothing to do with Christ at all. It's just if you exchanged your money, you got the paper, the church said you were forgiven. And Luther began to worry that people were going to think that they could buy their salvation. If they had enough money, they could buy their salvation. And Luther wanted sure answers to the questions. He didn't want, the, he didn't want a piece of paper saying he was forgiven. He wanted to know for sure that he was forgiven. Can I know my sins are forgiven before God? Can I know that God loves and accepts me into heaven? And the resounding scriptural answer is yes, but not because of the indulgences, not because of all the things that you do. You can know this because it is by grace alone that God has made this possible. And that's what Paul tells us today in our reading from Romans. Um, five, even today, 500 years after the Reformation, there are still many people who are laboring under the same delusion that many people in their medieval Roman Catholic Church were laboring under. That somehow we commend ourselves to God by what we do or by what we don't do. And when we live by that kind of a, by that kind of a system, I, I, the things that I do please God and the things that I don't do, the evils that I avoid also please God, we're working under a system of the law. Right? There's, there are things that you do to be, to be pleasing to God and there are certain things you don't do so that God will likewise be pleased with you. Basically, it's I do my part and Jesus does his part and together I'll be forgiven and make it to heaven. Now, of course, again, in a system of law, and we all know the most popular list of laws is the Ten Commandments, um, but even there, there are many other sections of Scripture that are likewise commands. The golden rule, do unto others as you would have done unto you. Love your neighbor as you love yourself are still law. As pious as they sound, they are still commands that we are given. And we know, <laughs> we know that we can't always do that. And yet God's word is also equally plain. Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And there was a problem. There was a problem for Luther and there remains a problem for us in our day. Because what Luther realized is, do you always love your neighbor as you love yourself? Do you always 
do unto others as you would have done unto you? Do you always have no other gods? The first commandment, do you always put God first in everything you always do? And of course, the answer is a resounding no. We all know that in many and various ways we break those commandments and so many more. So how is it that we could possibly be righteous in the eyes of an all-holy God? There is no way for us to, we stand condemned. Before, before a perfect judge, we know that we would, do, we would uh, all deserve judgment and penalty. But we naturally misunderstand the law if we think of the law as a means by which we get into good standing or right standing with God. If we look at the law as some way to earn God's favor, and as I said, it's because we can't keep it, the only thing the law does is condemn us. The only thing the law does is show us where we're wrong. And that's exactly what Paul says in our reading this morning. This is the proper understanding of the law from Scripture. Paul says no one will be declared righteous by observing the law. It doesn't matter how good you think you are, how many good deeds you think you do, how many bad deeds you think you avoid. No one will be declared righteous by observing the law. Rather, says Paul, through the law comes knowledge of sin. The law is a mirror. The law shows us just where, where we really stand in relation to God and His righteousness. It reveals that I can't be perfect, which means that I am condemned and be, before a righteous and holy God. And that's where Luther found himself in 1517, at the end of his rope, without any assurance that he was forgiven by God, the Roman Catholic Church had nothing to offer him until he turned and read the word, realizing that no matter how much he confessed, no matter how many pilgrimages he went on, no matter how many indulgences he bought or sold, it all relied on his effort and his striving, and that could never be perfect. But it was at that moment when he realized that there was nothing more that he could possibly do, that the truth of God's righteousness that phrase that he had come to hate so much, the truth of God's righteousness was revealed to him. And it was a spark that lit the flame of the Reformation. And it's the flame that continues to burn today as we look at Scripture. Luther writes, Day and night I tried to meditate upon the significance of this word, the righteousness of God is revealed in it, as it is written. The righteous shall live by faith, and he says, I began to understand that the righteousness of God is a gift. It's a gift of God by which a righteous man lives, namely his faith, indicating that the merciful God justifies us by faith, that is, as it is written. The righteous shall live by faith. And he says, now I felt as though I had been reborn altogether, and I had entered paradise. And in that same moment, the face of the whole of Scripture became apparent to me. See, Luther had rediscovered what Paul said so clearly in our reading this morning. A righteousness from God through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The answer had been staring him in the face all along. We aren't justified and forgiven by what we do, but by what Christ has done for us and then gives us freely. God's grace is the key. God's grace is the key that unlocks all of the treasures of Scripture. From Old Testament to New, we see the gracious acts of God in the salvation of His people, whether it's Israel or whether it's the world through Christ, the comfort of sins forgiven, the free gift of salvation given to all who believe. Brothers and sisters, on this Reformation Day, know that Scripture, Scripture is all about God's grace. God's grace in offering forgiveness and salvation to hostile and sinful people like us. And yet, when as hostile and sinful as we are, God reaches out to us to bridge the gap that we could never bridge and He draws us close to Himself. That's the treasure. That's the treasure that Luther had found in Paul's word to the Romans. A treasure that he was willing to risk his life for. And as Paul says, we deserve to be condemned, 
And yet God, out of His grace, punished Christ in our place, His own Son, so that we would have the free gift, the free gift of salvation when we deserved to be condemned. That's the truth of the Gospel that ignited the Reformation of the Church. And that's what we celebrate today. The message that countless people throughout the ages have been willing to risk their lives and die for and continues even today in many countries across the world. My brothers and sisters, you are saved by grace alone. Put your faith and trust in the one who has done all of this for you that you may know joy and the peace that passes all understanding. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit keep your hearts and minds through faith to life everlasting. Amen. And our service continues today with our creed. We confess our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed as they are printed. I believe, I believe in, in one God, God the, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty maker, maker of heaven and earth, and, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, God begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the, and the third day he rose again, according, according to, the to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified who spoke, spoke by, the, by prophets. the prophets. And, and I, I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And our service continues today with our prayers. Friends in Christ, I urge you all to lift up your hearts to God and pray with me as Christ our Lord has taught us and freely promised to hear us. God, our Father in heaven, look with mercy on us, your needy children on earth. Grant us your grace that your holy name would be hallowed by us and all the world through the pure and true teaching of your word and the fervent love shown forth in our lives. Graciously turn from us all false doctrine and evil living, whereby your precious name is blasphemed and profaned. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, may your kingdom come to us and expand. Bring all transgressors and those who are blinded and bound in the devil's kingdom to know Jesus Christ, your Son, by faith, that the number of Christians may be increased. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Strengthen us by your Spirit according to your will, both in life and in death, in the midst of both good and evil things, that our own wills may be crucified daily and sacrifice to your good and gracious will. Into your merciful hands, we commend all those on our prayer list and all those we bring before you in our hearts. Praying for them at all times, thy will be done. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And grant us our daily bread. Preserve us from greed and selfish cares and help us trust in you to provide for all of our needs. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, forgive us our sins as we also forgive those who sin against us so that our hearts may be at peace and may rejoice in a good conscience before you and that no sin may ever frighten or alarm us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And lead us not into temptation, O Lord, but help us by your spirit to subdue our flesh to turn from the world and its ways and to overcome the devil with all of his wiles. Lord, in your mercy. 
Hear our prayer. And lastly, O Heavenly Father, deliver us from all evil of body and soul, now and forever. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We trust, O Lord, in your great mercy to hear and answer us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Then, Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, our Father who, who art, art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy, thy will, will be done, done on earth, earth as, as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, give us this, this day our daily, daily bread, bread and, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive, forgive those who trespass against, against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver but us from evil. For thine, thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Almighty and gracious Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us steadfast in your grace and truth. Protect and deliver us in times of temptation. Defend us against all enemies and grant to your church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Go in peace as you serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our closing hymn today for this Reformation celebration is the church's one foundation. Please pause the service video and click the hymn link below.